Well, as Patty shared, um, it is uh, encouraging to be alongside a partner who is uh, living out <clears throat> a lot of what God called us to be about in Isaiah. He talked about how true worship is the idea of caring for the poor, working for those who are oppressed. And um, I don't know if you heard that list, um, but my goodness, to have 100 pastors gathered in a room, praying and equipped to reach those who are in the middle of sex trafficking, um, some drug cartel issues that are huge down at Mazalan, um, and uh, there's many stories with that, um, alongside just brokenness of poverty and alcoholism that is prevalent down there. And they are um, humbled and amazed at what God's doing because um, they didn't plan on doing all that. Um, they weren't sure what they were into until God started to bring pastor after pastor after pastor. And so what STS truly does, just so you're aware, is they work with pastors. They train pastors. They equip them in discipleship. They, they equip them in how to do ministry. And, and then they release them into their areas. And to have 100 men um, at the, at the uh, I want to say compound, that's a bad word, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, center um, is, uh, is truly amazing. And so I'm just thankful for John Reeser and even Paul Bassone, who we support here as a missionary down there, and um, all that they've done um, is incredible. I'd love to watch that. Um, so just some, some clarity on that, I just I love that so much and uh, can't say enough about it. So thank you, Patty, for praying for them and um, lifting them up this morning. Uh, we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 1 again today, and uh, we're going to be in the uh, second half of it. But um, Ephesians is a little further back in your Bibles. Uh, I said last week, if you don't know where it's at, there's a, a bunch of Ians around. So Galatians, Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. But um, it, was, uh, it was the summer of 2001, um, and it was uh, yet another youth ministry trip uh, in the summer. Uh, that we took annually every year up to Cedar Point, and uh, every single year uh, we prayed, you know, everybody would survive, including the leaders. Uh, we prayed the students would have a great time, they'd bring friends and the whole thing. But this year, 2001, uh, was the year I was really excited about because uh, we were able to go to the park knowing that in 2000 they had just put a brand new coaster in, and uh, I was so excited, and I didn't really care about the students. I was just going for me. Uh, and if anybody ruined my trip by making me go on the cups things again, uh, I was going to be really upset. Or the little Mad Hatter or the Avalanche thing, just whatever the thing is, goes around and around. You're probably not even there, thankfully. But uh, they, we always had kids. <laughs> Sorry, this is a rabbit trip. We always had those kids who were like, I don't want to ride the big rides. And I'm like, why did you come? Like, why are you here? Um, I just want to eat the food. Do you? That's a weird reason for coming. Anyway, uh, it was a big year, right? We wanted to ride this ride, and uh, it was the year of 2000 where Millennium Force was just built, and uh, highest, steepest, the whole thing. Um, and I could tell you all the details. For instance, uh, it is still one of my favorite rides. Uh, how many have been on it before? Anybody? Yes? You know? Uh, I can tell you all the details, right? It's 4.5 Gs that you're going to pull on this thing, which is just fantastic. Traveling at a speed of about 90 miles an hour at its peak. Uh, you're dropping 330 feet with a max vertical of 80 degrees off that first hill. And you know that hill is just amazing. It's ridiculous. Uh, and I can tell you it opened on May 13th, 2000, costing $25 million to build. People waited literally three to four hours in line to ride it when it first arrived. Um, I could tell you all those details and all those stats and all those facts about this ride, but what I cannot tell you is the pure panic you feel on that first hill. I cannot describe it. I can't tell you it. You have to experience it to realize the fact that you are free-falling, it feels, because you're not strapped to much in that. And you're just going down 330 feet drop. The feeling of the inability to scream on the first hill. I can't, I can't make you feel that. But when you're on it and you can't catch your breath and you're kind of like... <gasps> And you're like, I want to scream, but I can't all the way down the hill. The rush of wind that comes on that second turn, the joy it gives me to ride with new riders who have never been on the ride before. And I'm like, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And then they get in the ride, and you're like, it's that bad, right? And as they go up the road, I love it because I trick them onto the ride. And then once they're on it, they can't get off. It's so good uh, until the second hill. And then you look over, and you're like, you need to breathe because they're like, and nothing's coming out of their mouth. Like, breathe, just breathe, just breathe. And by the end of the ride, they're like, either I'm never ever coming to this place ever again and I hate you for tricking me, or that was amazing. And I'm pretty sure it's like 
amazing. And anyway, so uh, the joy of what it gives, and to watch their eyes explode on that first hill, it's it's the constant reminder like you can't ever uh, fully explain it. I can give you all the facts and all the details, but I cannot give you the feeling or the emotion that comes with it. I can't put into words this picture uh, from Jaden's first ride on this trip, right? Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how fun that was, where she was just like, I think I like it. And if you look closely in the very back, uh, you'll see a lady uh, right behind that dude's finger, and her, her whole face is just this. And she was like that for the entire ride. It was just fantastic, right? You can't put those into words. It's just an amazing, amazing thing. And so this morning, as we talk about uh, the gospel and all that we have, we talked about Ephesians being, it is truly all about the gospel and what we experience in the gospel. This morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best um, to explain what Paul is explaining in his prayer in Ephesians 1. But here's the reality that I know that, you, that, I, that I cannot do this morning. I cannot do what the Holy Spirit can do. I can't make you feel, I can't make you understand at a deeper level, I can't put a passion in you that only the Holy Spirit can give. Only he can do that. And so this morning, as we talk about this idea of what we have in Christ, we talked about last week that we have all these blessings that were given to us in Jesus, that was last week, and then this week, we're going to hear how that actually gets lived out. We're going to hear a prayer of, of Paul, of his desire that they would truly, as a church, understand all these spiritual blessings. It is a pastor's prayer that we're going to be in in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23 this morning. It's a prayer from a pastor, and it's a prayer over the Ephesian church, and it's a prayer of thankfulness, but it's also a prayer reminding us that we as pastors, uh, fellow believers in Christ, uh, we can't do what only the Holy Spirit can do. We can't accomplish what only he can. And it only comes truly through this idea of prayer that Paul gives us in Ephesians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. I'm going to read it. Uh, this is, again, another long run-on sentence of Paul. He, like, took a breath at 14, and then he just went again in 15. So there's like three or four, I think there's maybe even five, uh, just really long run-on sentences in Ephesians, and this is another one of them. So let me just read it this morning. We'll pray. We'll dive in. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Father, this morning we pray for your clarity and your wisdom, yes. But I pray as Paul prayed that you would open the eyes of our heart, that you would illumine your scripture in a way that only you can, that you would show us truly what it means to have our eyes opened to the hope and the glory and the power that you offer to us. Only you can do this. And so we pray that you would work in our midst this morning. We pray that you would work in ways that revive our hearts in Jesus. I pray that that would be true of you uh, in your working this morning. May I be diligent this morning in, in, in expounding what your word says, but ultimately you are the one who changes lives. So we ask you to do so this morning. So in your name we pray. Amen. For this reason, verse 15, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. So for this reason, let's just start there. So for this reason, there are five uh, truths that we can pull out of um, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14. Let me just give these to you quickly. Uh, your salvation is done by God. It is paid by Jesus. It is worked out with Jesus' power, secured by the Holy Spirit, guaranteed not to fail. 
That's good news. That's good reasons. That's good stuff to know that when you put your faith in Jesus, it was only done truly by God. It was paid by Jesus. It is worked out in this life that you live right now, today. It is worked out in Jesus' power. It is secured by the Holy Spirit, so you can't screw this up, and it is guaranteed not to fail. Those are just some of the things mentioned in verses 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. It is done by him. And he says, because of these things that are being done in the Ephesian church, like he would look around the room and he would say, hey, all of you in this room, if you have put their faith in Jesus Christ, you have these things. So I'm thankful for you that these are things that, that have been done on your behalf. And so I would say to us at Community Bible Church, I am thankful for what God has done here in raising up a church, in the idea that he is working in your lives on a regular basis. I am thankful this morning for so many things. As I was preparing for the sermon, I was thankful for the fact that we had a, a crazy enough group of people who said, we're willing to launch this thing with you. And so we had a launch team that looked like that, and I'm sorry that that's who you had start this thing. Uh, but this launch team was one that we had prayed over and thought about and, and really just, I, I look at that, those people and I'm, I'm just thankful for those who have said, I'm willing to put my life on hold and come and be part of something like this, right? I'm willing to come and start this thing called Community Bible Church. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, <laughs> that's a weird picture. That's, look how young everybody is. Uh, see what church planning does to you? It makes you old. Uh, so... Uh, just thankful for those, those people so much. And I'm thankful for those who came along the way, those who came at the elementary school and said, I'm willing to sit in hard benches for a, year, for a couple years and just really suffer through us of set up and tear down. I'm thankful for those of you who came during the high school years and, and we were over there setting in somewhat better chairs, but not really better, and, and, and set up and tear down and winters and, and frozen trailers and all the things of trying to get to the trailer when it's frozen and you have to bust it out or for getting locks to the trailer and all of a sudden you realize we have service starting in 30 minutes. How do we get this trailer open that we forgot the key? I did, right? All those stories and all those things that God has done and all the things of people who have come here to this place and this building that God has brought. And, and that's just attendance-wise. That's just like thankful for the people, for you all who are here. That's just attendance. I'm also thankful for the lives that have been changed, for those who have come and have either put their faith in Christ for the first time here, right? Or for those who have come and have said, I've, I used to do church I was part of a church, but I haven't been in church in years, and I don't even know if I'm fully into this thing called church, but you've come, and God has worked in your life, and God has transformed your marriages. God has transformed your relationship with your kids, and he's done these amazing things, and I am thankful. I'm thankful for a group of guys that I can text on a Friday afternoon and say, hey, there's a need that needs to be met in our community. Could you help? And they're right on it. I'm thankful for a guy in the back who runs sound who says, I'm willing to help you carry a dryer and purchase a dryer for a family in the area and say, I'm willing to do that at a, at a drop of a hat and I'll meet you and we'll pick this thing up and we'll get this thing going. I'm thankful for the gifts that God has put in this church. I, I, don't, I didn't tell David I was going to do this, but just to brag on David a little bit, we go to pick up this dryer and, and he just starts talking like it's no, nobody's big business. Like he, has a, he knows this guy, but not really. And he starts having a normal conversation. And I get in the truck and I'm like, David, I really wish you would just be more outgoing and could talk better to people. I just don't understand why you hold back so much. And I just, I just, I just watched as he just engaged. And within five minutes, this man was sharing a passion with David that he would never have shared with me because I had no idea what he's talking about. And yet David's easy response is, yeah, I totally understand. If you think that's awesome, you should put this motor in. And, this, and I'm like, I don't even know, right? Um, but the gifts and the abilities he's given to this church is truly amazing. And I am truly, honestly thankful. And like Paul, as we think of all the things we could be thankful for, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for a church that is willing to even go through this weird transition, let's just call it out, of two services. And weren't we packed? And now we're kind of in between. And what do we do? And I'm thankful for all of you and how God is using you in this community. Story after story of being used on school grounds, of, of being used in, 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 in living rooms with moms and little ones, of, of, of people who are killing it at work and, and reaching people in their businesses. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thankful for you as a church. And so you need to hear those things. I think we can just get so caught up and moving on to the next thing, that I can forget to say thank you. And so thank you for being a church who 
takes God seriously, who takes his word seriously, but ultimately we all understand we're all just messed up in some form or fashion along the way, and we need God's grace every single moment, which we're going to talk more about next week. Okay, stop there. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 and 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And then you get the request. So Paul says thank you to his church, and then he pulls this amazing request out of verses 17 to 18a, and here's the request, that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Let's pull this together real quick. Let's kind of make sense of this together. He says, may he give you a spirit of wisdom. What is a spirit of wisdom? What is that talking about? May he give you a spirit of wisdom. Well, we know from Acts chapter 18 and 19 that there were a group of men that got converted on the first run of starting this church, and it said that they received the Holy Spirit um, when they accepted Christ, when they, when they found out that it wasn't a works-based salvation anymore. It wasn't just following John's rule, it was following Christ. And we can explain that later, but for the sake of simplicity this morning, they, when you accept Jesus Christ, you already get the Holy Spirit. So I take this as meaning they, they already have the Holy Spirit. This isn't like they're just getting the Holy Spirit. It's not like he's praying that onto them. I believe this is a movement of the Holy Spirit, that if somebody has Jesus, this is a work that, that the Spirit can do that enables them to receive God's wisdom and his revelation. Now, again, this is not, maybe in church world, you maybe heard the statement or the phrase second blessing. I don't believe that's what this is. I don't believe in that uh, as far as how God works. I think this is just a simple prayer from a pastor who is praying for his people, and he's praying a prayer that he knows he can't accomplish. And he's saying, I can't give you the wisdom and the knowledge and the revelation that the Holy Spirit can put into you. To harken back to our trip to Cedar Point, I can tell you all the facts, but I cannot give you what the Holy Spirit can give you. I can give you all the details, but I can't do the work. And so he's praying this movement of God would be for wisdom and of revelation, that the eyes of their heart would be open. This is a phrase that's dating back to King David in the Psalms. It talks about our eyes of our heart being open. It basically means that our souls would be engaged. We talked about in Draw Close that meditation is that thing that is able to break that gap between our head to our heart. Remember how we said sometimes there's that hard distance to get from our head to our heart and it sometimes gets clogged? That meditation is a way for our head to engage with our heart. That's what he's saying. He says, I'm praying that through meditation, through looking at Jesus, through answering his prayer, that the Holy Spirit could do what only he could do and that he would open their eyes to see something different, a freedom that only he could give. I, I, I've seen this happen. You've probably seen this happen in somebody's life where they think they know the gospel. They think they know because they said a prayer and yes, they are saved, but they've never truly engaged it. And then you start to open up scripture. You start to share stories. And all of a sudden there's a different demeanor. I could share story after story of people here who have said, yeah, I went to church for a long time, 10, 12 years, and it was okay. But when I got to know Jesus, things changed. It wasn't just about attending a church anymore. It was about engaging with a person. And, and, and what he's praying is that that would happen, that they would have the spirit of wisdom to open their eyes to their heart, to go from facts to enlightened, to go from just data to a relationship. You see, I can tell you all about Millennium Force. I can tell you all about my kids. I can tell you about my middle one who was on the ride with me, I could tell you that her heart and her compassion is big. I can tell you that God's just put that in her from a child. Like, we've just watched it, like, grow and grow and grow. Like, she just has a, a heart and a compassion that is just out, outshines anything I have. <laughs> uh, she's smart. She loves to figure things out. She can sit and, and, and work somebody through a problem and solve it with them. We've seen it happen. I'm like, how do you even make sense of that topic? And yet you're able to break it down. I think she's going to be a great teacher one day. I really do. Um, it, it, but those are just facts. And I can tell you all the facts, but seeing it, living it, experiencing it, being in the room with it, that's different, right? I can tell you all about the strengths of my wife. I can tell you it. I can tell you that she is an amazing, strong woman. I can tell you that she has... Uh, 
well, I'll tell you all of those things. I, I haven't cleared anything with her, so I'm not going to say a lot. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you that even listing a lot of her strengths and her resolve, and I could tell you all these things about her, but I won't because I didn't clear it. Uh, I could tell you all the facts and all the data, but I cannot put into words the love that I have for her. I can't put into words the, 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 the life that we've had, the experiences we've shared. They are truly just ours, and I don't take those feelings or experiences for granted. And what it does in both my, my, my child and, and my wife, what it does is it takes it from fighting for an a, a institution or fighting for a, a thought or fighting for, in this case, fighting for a religion. It takes it from fighting for a religion to fighting for a person, right? We'll talk about it as we close out. But, but it, it, it's about not just a religion. It's about a relationship with God. And, and, and I'm not against religion. I think there's a, there's a lot of good that happens, right? I'm just saying, what Paul is saying here is, I am praying that the Holy Spirit would do a work that he, only he could do and illumine our hearts and our eyes to see the person of Jesus Christ. My hope and prayer like Paul is that we would not just see the facts about Jesus. We would have a heart for Jesus. We would have moments of hearing from him. We would have moments of being transformed by him. We would have things that happen in our relationship in, with him that we were desperate to share with somebody else. I pray that, that you just can't hold it in any longer. You're like, I got to tell you what he did, and it's incredible. I pray that that happens on a regular basis for us, that we would wish desperately that we could take our heart for Jesus and we would put it into somebody else who's hard and doesn't want anything to do with him. You ever been there? We just wish you could just take your heart out of your chest and be like, just experience this for just a little bit, and you're going to see how amazing it is. And we, we have those moments where, where God is so good, we do those things. And, and again, we can go to facts or we can go to the person. In other words, we can say the fact that Jesus is kind. That is a straight fact. It is biblical and it is true. I can tell you that fact that Jesus is kind, but I cannot put on a page this morning the mornings that he has shut the devil's face for me and shut his mouth and said, just shut up. Because that's not true. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word, but I just did. Uh, <laughs> parents in the room are like, he's almost done. Um, <clears throat> where I've had moments where he silenced the enemy on my behalf and said, those are lies. You don't need to listen to those. This is the truth. And in this kindness, he drew me away from the lies, and he put me into truth on a regular basis. The mornings he's done that. The times during the week that I pour over scriptures, and there's just tears coming. I'm like, I have no idea why, but it's just God transforming me because he's kind. I can tell you on a fact basis that Jesus is grace. But I can't put on a page the mornings that he continues to show himself again and again as faithful when I am not I can tell you that Jesus is strong, but I can't put on a page the many times I have doubted him, yelled at him, controlled him, like uh, trying to control him like a spoiled kid, and he just took it. And he said, I hear you, but I'm strong enough to take all that, and I'm strong enough to love you through it. I can tell you that Jesus is a father as a straight fact, but I can't put on a page the many times he's held me close, calmed me down from my fits of anger, and slowed me down from running too far ahead and just said, you're my kid, just hold on, we got this, just slow down. You're good. You don't need to prove yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm your dad. We're, we're okay. I can tell you the fact that Jesus is a creator, but I can't put on a page views from the parks out in Zion or sitting on a beach and the ocean rolling in. And the moment you sit there on a beach or the moment you witness his creation and you sit there and you say, yes, I know he's a creator, but there are different moments of experiencing where you sit back and you just ask the question, how big am I really? <laughs> am I really that important? In the midst of all he's created, in the midst of everything else, it's the question I love to ask. Do you see anything outside that's bigger than you? <laughs> do you see anything in all creation that's bigger than you? I hope you do because, it's, again, it's speaking to a fact, but it's not the same as knowing it. Paul's prayer is that the Ephesians church and the we here would know him in three different areas this morning. So let me just go into these this morning before we go into our, our time of worship here in a little bit. Um, he says, I want you to know these things. He says, I want you to know these and not just uh, know them, but your eyes will be open to the first one, verses 17 uh, to 19. So let me just read these real quick. So he says that the God of the Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and knowledge of him, 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, 
What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might. So the first thing he says, I want you to know the hope. I pray that you as a church, he says, I pray that you as the Ephesian church would know the hope to which he has called you. This hope is, is built on a promise, and this promise is that God will not fail, that God will not abandon us, that God won't change his mind, that God will continue to see us through. That is the hope that we have. And there are ultimately many other things that we can find in that statement of the hopes that we have. But let me just read out of Romans chapter 8, 24 to 25, this idea of hope again. He says it differently to the Romans, but he says in Romans chapter 8, he says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope, is, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. He says, there's a reason, <laughs> there's a reason that the Christian life is hard. There's a reason why it's difficult. It's because we can't always see the end. It's because we can't always see what God's doing. And we hope and we hope that he's a God who keeps his promises, and he's a God who's faithful, and he's a God who's true. And we pray it, especially in our families, right? I hope <laughs> he's, he's that good to my family. I hope he's that good with my kids, and we have to turn those over, to, I hope. But, but he says this is a hope that's confident. It's a hope that saved us. We're going to see that in the end of this. It's a hope that is not seen. It's one that is built on faith, and yet Thankfully, as you've probably seen in the news, God gives us times of, of hope. He gives us seasons uh, or moments where we can kind of look and say, wow, maybe God is truly still working. And I'm sure I'm, I'm, you, you may have seen it. I hope you have. Um, the idea of revivals that are happening around the, the, the country right now, and obviously the biggest one is Asbury down in Kentucky, and it seems to be this movement that God's doing. And a lot of questions are coming out of this movement out of Kentucky, and you've probably seen it on the news, and I just find it interesting. Um, I find it interesting because, one, it, it gives me hope of God still working, um, but it also makes me a little sad uh, in the fact that uh, the first response from us as a nation, it just became highlighted even more clearly, I guess, um, how cynical we've become, right? Isn't it true? Like, everybody's like, well, we'll see. Like, even, even myself, like, I'm not picking on you. I'm picking on me. I'm like, I hear this, and I'm like, well, we'll see. And I'm like, what is that about, right? I don't know fully what God's doing. I don't fully understand it. I'm going to guess plenty of people are kind of like, ah, well, well, we'll give it some time, right? It's been about 10 days. Um, God still continues to be moving. And I think here's the things I'm hoping to see out of it. Not just that it's worship, although that's fantastic. I hope that we continue to see confessions repentance and turning to God, because revival truly is, if you want a definition of revival, it is truly confession and getting our hearts right and saying, here's all my stuff, and I need to repent and find you. And as a result of most revivals we've seen in time, and even the ones down at Asbury and, and, and beyond, is that there is a movement of God for conversions. There's a great people moving towards the faith as a result of them, and there's an outpouring of needs to help those who are hurt or those who are wounded or those who have been oppressed. So for me, I, I look at this and I'm like, man, there is a hope. That is encouraging that there is a group and a body of believers and people who are flocking to it to see it. And they're like, is this truly what God's doing? This is amazing. On other campuses and things like that, you know, I'll pick on Cedarville because my friend works there. But, you know, you get Asbury, they're like, let's do this. You get Cedarville, it's kind of like, well, we're not really sure what's happening, but we're going to judge it cautiously. You know, and I'm like, ah, it's so Cedarville, I get it. Uh, it would be moody. Moody would be the same way, I get it, so I just pick on me too. But, but it's this movement that God seems to be doing, but I'm hoping that comes into more. Because here's the reality. Just as on that college campus those things are happening, we also get news during the same week of a shooting up in Michigan State. And, and, and as much as God's working on those college campuses at Asbury, I pray that he'll be working just as heavily on those campuses that are having to deal with tragedy and trauma of a guy who decides to just take the lives of college students for the, for the fact that he was just slighted in some way. We can't make sense of it. But I'm hoping that as a movement, we see God moving his people to action. Not just that we are, are good and we're comfortable and we, we get that he, he loves us, and that, but we be moved to take 
action. We would actually care for the poor and the oppressed. We would do a lot of things like shoulder to shoulder of, of reaching the needs that are in their community, of working against the cartel and working against these children who have no say in the matter of their lives being torn apart or, or other areas, right? We, we want to be a, a church that's doing those. And, and this hope that he gives us, all that to say, this hope that he gives us is a hope that thankfully he's given us a gracious look into it of worship and sparked in this thing down, down in Kentucky, but, but he's also giving us a confidence and a hope that says it's not just the event, it's truly about Jesus. It's not hoping an event. It's not hoping in, man, what if that would happen in this church? What if it happened in that church? What if we could start revival in this one or that one? And praise God if it did. Fantastic. I would love it humbled by it. If we would come and confess our sins and say, God, this is where I failed and we want you to lead us. Awesome. But it's not about an event. It's about Jesus. It's about hoping in him. Because hope in a person is helpful. But hoping in Jesus is confident. It is secure. Hoping in Jesus is not just hoping in a person. It is hoping in a promise Hope, as the Greeks would have seen it in this letter, would have seen faith mixed with pleasure in this word called hope. It wasn't just that they believed it. There was a pleasure that went with it. There was a goodness that went with it. I pray that for us. There'd be a goodness and a pleasantness that goes with our faith, faith and pleasure together. He says, I hope that they would know the hope to which he has called you. I pray that your eyes would be open to it every single day. That you have a God who has guaranteed a promise to you and he's not going to fail. I could go on forever on it, but I'm not going to, I'm going to move on to the next one. I pray that it would be a hope that we, we would all be able to experience by his power and by his might only way. Secondly, he says, I pray that it would not only be a hope, I pray that it would be an inheritance. Uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, knowledge of him. Eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know the hope. Then secondly, I pray that you would know what the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints are. This glorious inheritance is this idea of adoption, election, predestination, grace, forgiveness, insight, understanding, knowledge of his will, and sealing. All of these are because we are in him. And because we are in him, because Christ has given us new life, he's promised us that you are heirs. You are sons and daughters. You get everything Jesus got. And he says, I'm, I'm laying for you an eternity of even more than you can imagine. So the inheritance is yes for this life. You will be able to do, you will be able to experience the things that Jesus did. You'll be able to, to hear uh, as Jesus heard. You'll be able to understand because you are in him, he gives these things to us. And it will not be taken away. But he says there's also an inheritance that we have waiting for us in eternity. A land in eternity that will not be taken away. To the people of Ephesians, they will have a rule that is not Rome. They will have a servant king waiting for us that we can experience, touch, know, be held by a servant king waiting for us. There will be no more lying, selfish, ignorant people anymore. It will only be the beauty of what Jesus put in us and the beauty of Christ himself as we look towards eternity. It is a truthful king, not Leaders who continue to lie and manipulate to get power and authority of their own power and authority. We will see a king who is truly a servant king waiting for us. Not a king of low morality, but one who can be trusted. A king of holiness and a king of power awaits us. And, and, and truly, I think we can think of all the stuff we could get in heaven. But ultimately, he's saying, your stuff is Jesus. <laughs> your stuff is the king. And if the king isn't enough... Maybe that's the question. Because Paul's praying that the king would be enough, that Jesus would be enough for everything that we need. He says later, not in this book, but another one, he says, I've learned to be content in all things, whether it's really excelling in, in, the, in the stuff or whether it's having nothing but a prison cell. I, I've been content in all of it. I hope for us as a church that Jesus is enough. And here's the deal, I know I know there are times where we're just like, I, I want that to be true, Joel. I want that to be true. But there are times he's just, I feel like he's not. I get it. I get it. So come to him like that. Ask him. Say, I know you're, not, I know you're enough, but I just don't, I, I want it to be different. Tell him. Pray it. 
Paul's praying it for these Ephesians church, that they would be different. They would know that God is enough in, in hope and in inheritance. They have something waiting for them that trifles all the things here. And then lastly, and this is incredible prayer, not only does he pray for their hope in Jesus, not only does he pray that they would know the inheritance of what they truly have in Jesus, he says, I pray that they would know the power of Jesus. The hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. Power only comes through letting go of your own. I wish I could complicate it more. (laughs) I wish I could dive that deeper. But for this morning, here's what you need to know about this power that he's praying. Power only comes through letting go of our own. And when we are able to let go of our own, we can trust him to move. Well, how's that going to work? Because I still got a job to do. I got kids to take care of. I got money to come in. I got all these things to take care of. You're just telling me to just let all that go? I'm telling you to be wise. (laughs) But I'm telling you to ask for an ability to do it in a way that only Christ supplies. The power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. That this power he offers of us is for those of us who are tired of living without it. I'm tired of hearing it only comes through culture, tired of it only comes through walking up the ladder of success, this power come that it's not available, that somehow we just have to keep mustering it ourselves. I'm tired of tired of trying to make it happen. And Paul's saying, well, then pray. Pray that the power of God will work in your life as it did in his own. Because Paul had to empty himself of his own power. Paul came to God through an emptiness of power. I love Paul's... Uh, a conversion, and I love the phrase that's used in the King James uh, when it talks about his coming to Jesus. It says in Acts 9, 5, and this is his reaction to God as he finds him. And Paul said to Jesus as he comes, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. That's a problem, okay? That's a different conversion. I don't know many of us who have like said, God, I want to find you. Would you help me find you? You're like, great, stop being an idiot and, coming and fighting against me and actually humble yourself and come beneath me. Because Paul was, and I love this, he says, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, this is an interesting thing. It's basically this long stick that you'd use to probe goats uh, uh, back in the agricultural and all the sheeping days. I don't even know if that's what it's called. Uh, sheeping days of the, old, of the New Testament, right? And they would just have to goat them and push them, and they would just kind of bristle against it. And I love this image of Paul where he's just like pushing against it and pushing against it. I don't want anything to do with you, God. I don't want anything to do with you. And, and he, he, he almost asks it as a question. Is it hard for you to keep kicking against me? Because it's a way to, to, to make that stop. And that's just to, to come underneath my power. There's a way to make this easier. Just humble yourself and come under my power so that you can truly understand what power looks like. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. The power I have for you is that you would just... Lose your own and take on mine. And it may not be as quick and as easy as you want it to be, but let me just tell you, it is worth coming under the authority and power of this. And Paul says to the Ephesian church, hey, I'm praying that your hope would be there. You would know what he's called you towards in eternity. And lastly, that you would know the power to which he has given you. This morning, um, as we kind of wrap up, I just want to put it this way. Um, Every... Every premarital uh, t- session, I don't know what I call it, counseling, because we're not that good at it. Uh, every premarital <laughs> dinner, I don't know. I don't know what you call them. Um, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> just put it out there. Uh, we're not really good at it. Uh, but um, every premarital one we've done, there's been one constant theme uh, or one constant statement I always say, and it's been this way since I, I began. It was something that somebody told me. I don't even remember where I found it. It's not mine. I ripped it off and, and used it. Um, but every premarital I talk about is um, we say you have to change your mindset. When you get married, it's different. You, you have to go from the idea of fighting for a marriage to fighting for a person. And we say this all the time. And whether they do it or not or whether they listen or not, I don't know. Um, <laughs> time will tell. 
But we, but we say you, there, there, there's a big difference between fighting for a marriage versus fighting for a person. Because I think in the Christian world, we've always been taught, like, you just can't fail in marriage. It's got to just make sure you're, you're in it, through it. And, and you could do it. I mean, you could fight for a marriage and be okay. You could fight for the fact of trying not to break up, and that's okay. You could fight for just staying together for the kids, and that's admirable, I guess. Um, but there's a difference between fighting for a marriage versus fighting for a person. And when I start fighting for a person, it changes things. Because it's not just about just trying to keep her happy. It's not just about trying to just make sure the marriage is okay, that everybody doesn't see something from the outside that they shouldn't see that's really happening inside, that, that we got this good image going on and all these things. We, we, we say it because it truly changes everything when I'm fighting for Carrie and Carrie's fighting for Joel versus we're fighting to just keep this thing alive, right? Because when I'm fighting for her, it is so much let me just say this, it's so much better and it's so much harder <laughs> because there's a person with all of their flaws and all of their insecurities. She, I'm talking about me, not her. <laughs> and all of these things that, that come with it. And she's got to love me as a person through it because she's fighting for me and I'm fighting for her. And as a result of that, we have a really healthy, good marriage because of that. But, but it's, it's I'm fighting for the person, not the institution. And I can tell you there's conversation after conversation that have defined this again and again for us in our marriage. But ultimately, it's about the relationship. It's about fighting for the person. And what Paul's asking the Ephesians to understand here is you're not fighting just for the religion. You're not just fighting for the sake of you're saved. It's not just fighting for the sake of the, the, the words and the facts of being a Christian. You are fighting every single day to find Jesus to make him the priority, to search for him, to find him and know him well. That is what we are called to do, to know him better every single day. And we do that through his word and through prayer. And Paul says, I pray that that would happen. Because as it happened to Paul, we get this at the very end. Paul goes into just another impromptu worship session. <laughs> So he goes from the beginning of like prayer of all these things and all these dad and all these things. And then he ends with this. And we're going to end with this. Uh, the team, you guys can come on up as we, as we close out in worship. But um, he ends with this. I love this. He says, these are all the things I hope, that you, that you find hope, that you find the inheritance, you find power. And then he just goes on this worship session for the last couple verses in 20 to 23. In many Bibles and in many commentators, they actually break these two up. Where it stops with a prayer and then it goes into worship. And this is that worship section. He says, I pray these things that you would, you would know the power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. And then he goes into, here's the praise session. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's like he couldn't stop. It's like he just kind of just kept worshiping and saying and praising for what he was, and he says, magnificent theological truths, but it's out of a heart of worship that Christ's power that he raised him with would be seen in us, far above all rule and authority, not only in this age, but in the one to come, and that we would see, experience the fullness of him. Community, let me pray for us as we head into this time, and this is your opportunity then to respond to him. If anything, he has spoken to you in the, in the last couple of minutes together of working through Ephesians, this is that time to come back and say, God, thank you for that. Thank you for finding me. Thank you for giving me hope. Thank you for, for loving me through this. So let me pray for you as we head into a time of worship this morning. Father, we thank you so much for not just calling us to a, a religion or, or an institution, but calling us truly to you, to Jesus to the person, the author, perfecter, founder of our faith, the cornerstone, the one who will never stop, the one who we can build our lives upon, the one who we can trust fully with no matter what we've brought in this week, the one who loves us and forgives us generously and graciously, the one who leads us sacrificially, the one who 
calls us to follow him even when it's tough, the one who disciplines us when we've gone astray, the one who loves us enough to hold us accountable to your word, the one who, who offers everything in between. Father, we thank you this morning. We pray that our hearts would sing truths back to you, and they wouldn't just be because they're on a screen, but because you're doing a work in us. I pray that your spirit would work in us this morning in a way that only you could as we return and worship you in our time together this morning. You're going to pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we worship you?